First question, what are the main characteristics of the Lean Startup? So the Lean Startup takes its inspiration from Lean Manufacturing, which was a radically new way of building products that has really changed the world of physical goods. But in the world of entrepreneurship and innovation, what I have found in my experience is that most of the time we're building products that don't lead to any kind of success. So we're fundamentally wasting people's time. And the Lean Startup is an alternate way, a different way of building new startups, new products, uh, doing disruptive innovation in the context of both small companies and large companies, nonprofits, governments, private sector, everywhere. The principles are that a startup exists in order to learn how to build a sustainable business. So its unit of progress is not how much stuff it has or how many customers it has, but fundamentally is it figuring out the mechanics of how to build a sustainable business. And therefore, we want to develop a whole man set of management techniques for uh, building products in an iterative fashion with customer involvement and a much more scientific approach to innovation. So in your view, what is Lean UX and how is it different from non-Lean UX, from fat UX? Yeah. I mean, design is a very important part of the process in Lean Startup. The way I like to think about it is if you, if you look at the classic way that interaction design has been done, you read the classic works on it, one of my favorites is um, Take the Inmates Are Running the Asylum. I mean, it's a great book. I recommend it all the time. Uh, and it recommends a very iterative, very customer-centric way of thinking about products. Or you look at design thinking or the IDEO model. These are very iterative approaches. But what is happening is that the iteration and experimentation happens inside the design box of an otherwise very linear process. The outcome of the design process is a specification document, which is as rigid and unitterative a, a process as you can imagine. And the embedded in that workflow is an assumption that all the learning and experimentation happens at the beginning. We figure out what the customer wants, what the product should be, and then we hand it off to some other people. In software, it tends to be we hand it off to the code monkeys who just do what they're told and implement it. People who've actually built products that way know that they have a very high mortality rate. Because the issue is usually not that the research wasn't very good, nor is it about getting the final product to have high fidelity to the research, although that is an issue. The problem is that it fundamentally views a product as ever being done. But in our modern world, products are never done. There's no such thing as a done product. As soon as we launch anything, we're immediately working on the next version. So we need to have a process that, that takes that into account so that we're doing continuous innovation. So what, the way I think about new products is that every design decision that we make is actually a hypothesis in the scientific sense. It is a proposal about how we as a company can change customer behavior for the better. Designers help us make better hypotheses in the same way that theorists help scientists conduct more interesting experiments. So in, a, in some ways, designers get to play the role of Einstein in this scientific discovery process. That's really fun. But you can't imagine Einstein putting on a black turtleneck and just telling people, I know all the answers to everything. Instead, his job was to come up with interesting theories that then other people could run experiments on to verify that they were correct, and some were correct, some not. And between the theorists and those who are running the experiments, we have this feedback loop. We call it build, measure, learn. And the goal of Lean Startup is to minimize our total time through that loop so that the continuous innovation is happening as quickly as possible. Talked about it earlier. When I ask UX people who practice user research, what are their biggest, uh, what is their biggest challenge? I usually hear how hard it is to engage stakeholders such as engineers, product managers, and executives with user research. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? Departments are the enemy of progress. Okay. That that fundamentally, the reason why you have resistance across functions is that people are set up in these siloed departments and they think of their job as to produce their deliverable which gets handed off waterfall style from department to department. Believe it or not, every other department feels the exact same way. They can't get you, whoever you are, to pay attention to their important deliverables. And they don't understand why you're handing them things that don't answer the questions that they have. So this whole waterfall approach is the cause of the problem. Now, I know it doesn't seem that way. I know the way it seems is that those idiots just don't get what you awesome people produce. Believe me, the engineers feel the same way, and so do the marketing people and the MBAs. Everyone feels that way because we're not speaking a common language, and we don't have a common set of facts for evaluating our own progress. The solution to this problem is actually 
to stop uh, giving people deliverables. Like, do not produce reports. Instead, build truly cross-functional teams that work together through the entire life cycle of the product. And this is not the most popular advice because what it means is throughout the life cycle of the product, sometimes you're going to have engineers doing user research and seeing customer reactions firsthand. That might sound good, but it also means that sometimes you're going to have designers writing code. You're going to have QA people writing specifications. You're going to have uh, documentation people doing QA. I mean, it, everybody does whatever it takes. Fundamentally, entrepreneurship is a job title. When you're trying to create something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty, you are an entrepreneur. I don't care what it says on your business card. And so if we're going to manage new products correctly, we have to explicitly embrace the role of the entrepreneur. And one of the characteristics of entrepreneurship is that we no longer have a functional, uh, functional profession. We're no longer an engineer. We're no longer a user research person. We are someone who does whatever it takes to make the product work. You coach and advise startups on lean startup methodologies and, uh -huh. and ideas. One thing I'm hearing and experiencing with startups make me feel, makes me feel that startups and UX research uh, people are almost always not going hand in hand. Uh -huh. And sure. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, the basic notion of a startup founder, and I might be wrong here, is that we know what people need. Uh -huh. And the basic notion of a, of a UX researcher is, I have no idea what people need. Let's find out. Yep. What do you think about this? Both perspectives are 100% wrong. And also, they have a kernel of truth lurking in there. Right now, all we can do is argue. The status quo is we argue. Whoever has the most political clout in their organization will win the argument. So if it's an engineering culture organization, the engineers will win in the end. The designers will be perpetually frustrated. And if it's a design-oriented company, then the designers will win and the engineers will be perpetually frustrated. But that doesn't have to be that way. Plus, customers don't care who politically wins. They only care about the end result. So let's just start with the facts. The facts are that customers do not know what they want. I mean, human beings are perpetually unable to say how they would behave in hypothetical situations. So if you show somebody a product concept and say, would you buy this? And they say, yes, you have not collected any information whatsoever. Anyone who's actually tried to use user research to drive any kind of decision making knows this implicitly. And there's a lot of good science to back up why that's the case. It is also the case that as startup founders or entrepreneurs or product visionaries of any kind, we do not know what customers want. We only think we know. We have a theory, a hypothesis about what they probably want. And right now, in the kind of stage gate or waterfall method, because fundamentally we are set up to make go-kill decisions at each stage, it's very dangerous to admit any manner of uncertainty because someone higher up will be like, oh, they're not sure what customers want, kill it. And believe me, entrepreneurs and VCs have the same negotiation all the time. But when we change the paradigm, this problem actually goes away. We all agree, one, that we have a strong point of view about what we hope customers will want, what they ought to want according to our business plan. And we have a rigorous methodology for testing to discover which elements of our vision are brilliant and which ones are crazy. And then we don't make go-kill decisions. We never kill the idea. Instead, we pivot to a better idea once we have learned something. And in that process, that continuous innovation process, founders and engineers and user research and designers all have a role to play. All of us can bring our skills to bear to make the team more effective. But that's the goal, building great products. When should startups hire their first UX person, in your opinion? There is no universal answer to that kind of question. Startups need all of the functional disciplines at their disposal. They need to be able to do business planning. They need to be able to do design. They need to be able to do user research. They need to be able to build products in whatever their industry is. They need to be able to verify that those products work. They need some kind of operations, logistics. I mean, there's a lot that startups have to do. Entrepreneurs often find themselves with a two-person team that needs 10 functional specialties. That's why entrepreneurship is fundamentally cross-functional. Everybody has to wear different hats all the time. That's the nature of the beast. And entrepreneurs have an opportunity to build organizations that remain cross-functional as they scale. So that rather than thinking of your company as a 1,000-person organization, we could think of it as 110-person startups. 
that's a lot more interesting place to work, believe me, although the coordination challenges, of course, are higher. So when do you hire somebody? It's when you fundamentally are lacking a, a very specific skill set in your company that you don't have. But here's the thing, you always have to make a build versus, I'm mean, sorry, a hire versus learn decision. Should we hire a UX research person or should we learn to do it ourselves? And actually in entrepreneurship, there's actually always a right answer, which is you should always try to learn it yourself first. My opinion is you never hire anybody into a startup unless you're hiring them to do a job that you currently do right now. And you could be doing it badly, but that's okay. Doing it badly is better than not doing it at all. And in that process, then as a startup founder, you're doing 10 different jobs. Some of them you're doing well, some you're doing badly, but look, they're growing. So you have to shed jobs constantly, and then you can make an intelligent decision. Boy, would the company accelerate through the build, measure, learn feedback loop faster if I had one more engineer or a user research person or something else? What job do I want to shed next? That's the framework that you can use to decide. So I relocated to the U.S. about four years ago from Israel. Uh -huh. um, Israel is known for being a startup nation with three, four thousand, I don't course, know yeah. the exact number, active startups, um, second only to Silicon Valley. And the Israeli startups are very strong on the technology side, but are very lacking on the UX and design side. Yes. Um, what do you often suggest to startups who want to be better in design? Here's the problem. Let's say you wake up one morning as a technical founder and you say, I want to be better in design. So your first instinct is to go hire a designer. So you interview 10 designers. One guy comes in with a black turtleneck and says he's the second coming of Steve Jobs. The next person comes in and says uh, they are the reincarnation of Jared Spool. And the next person comes in and they say that they don't know anything but they do great research. And another person comes in with a beautiful portfolio of beautiful things that they claim to have designed in the past. And so on and so forth. How do you know who to hire? Half of those people are probably charlatans, making up stuff, trying to put on an act to do, in, in entrepreneurship we call it success theater, you might call it here design theater, right? They're trying to put on a show for you to make you think that they're going to be a great designer because fundamentally what they, their proposal, all of them make you the same proposal, which is listen, you already have some process for deciding what to do. I recommend that you insert me into the point of the process where all the good decisions get made and let me make those decisions for you. So just delegate to me everything that's interesting about your business and you take care of all the really boring things. You can imagine how well that negotiation goes and why that hiring conversation is quite challenging, especially for an engineer who they're not a trained designer, they don't know how to evaluate these proposals. So that whole model is really flawed. Instead, if you want to get better at design, you have to do design yourself. I believe that's the only way to get better. And as you start to do design, then you'll start to realize the kinds of issues you need help with. And then you'll have a framework for plugging a designer into that's effective. If you fundamentally think you know the answers to the questions about what your customer wants, then there's no reason to hire a designer. It's a waste of time because you're wrong, but the designer can't help you. They're just going to argue with you about your product. For some reason, entrepreneurs love having arguments about what their product should be, even though they're never convinced that they're wrong. But they find it intellectually satisfying to, to win all these arguments because the founders always think they know what to do. The framework we need instead is to translate all of these opinion battles into empirical questions for testing. So let us discover which elements of our product are brilliant and which ones are wrong. Even if you're 100% right about everything, let's just double check. Double check that the world really does work the way that your business plan says. And then once you have that framework in place, you can bring a designer in, whether they have a black turtleneck or not, and say, start doing some designs that we will test empirically. If the designs outperform what we were doing before, then it's, a, then it's a win. My principle of design is good design changes customer behavior. That's it. So something might look pretty, but if it doesn't change customer behavior, it's a bad design. Okay, last question. I'm sure you know that. Uh, I'm extremely excited about the traction of the Lean Startup and Lean UX ideas. Uh, and the reason is that what you're preaching for uh, is actually something we're trying to preach for three decades without success. Right. Um, so now people are open to learning um, uh, about UX for the benefit of their users. Excellent. And this has not been the situation. <laughs> um, I know. What do you think changed? Well, I mean, I, I, the success of the Lean Startup movement is not about me. You know, I mean, I've obviously been talking about this for a few years now, and, and we've had a lot of success in getting the word out. 
I am very grateful to all the entrepreneurs who have tried to put these ideas into practice and have been evangelists for it. I actually think we are going through a paradigm shift in management and that all of the efforts before and we had this in programming too with agile, all manner of agile methodology. I mean, this is not, every function has been grappling with these same problems because we've all been locked into a common work structure that incidentally is exactly 100 years old this year. The idea that we, what we call management was once called scientific management. And the book, The Principles of Scientific Management by Frederick Winslow Taylor was published in 1911. And since that time, we have basically been living in Fred Taylor's world. Human beings are not good at seeing systems. We tend to, to, we commit the fundamental attribution error, it's called in psychology. When something happens, when somebody does something we don't like, we assume that it's due to their personality, their character, they're a bad person. Of course, when we do something wrong, it's because of circumstances. But anyway, other people, when they do stuff we don't like, it's their character. But it turns out that people's behavior is much more governed by context and systems. And it's not to say that there aren't bad people in the world, of course there are, but most of the people at work have been carefully screened by somebody who really went out of their way to eliminate the truly bad people. So when departments go to war with each other, it's not because there's the good people versus the bad people, it's because they are locked in a bad system. And the Lean Startup is a new management paradigm that is attempting to reform the system of work so that we can all work together in a more effective way. Once you make those systemic level changes, awesome things happen. Like we build products that people actually want. And entrepreneurs, the like true bootstrap, you know, Silicon Valley venture backed entrepreneurs, they have been the early adopters of this model because they have the most to gain from the new model and they are having the worst pain in the old model. These are people who pour life, years of their lives into products that nobody wants that are doomed to failure from the start. That is a very painful thing to do. I mean, I've personally done it many times in my career. Trust me, it sucks. So they have been the first to to start with this, but the movement is spreading, you know, into big companies, into governments, into nonprofits, into different functions. And I think design is one of the next frontiers for a lean startup. When we break down those departmental barriers, but then replace them with, you know, not chaos, but a different, very disciplined, very specific approach to testing our ideas to discover what works and what doesn't, we are going to live in a world where all that time and energy that is currently being wasted is redeemed for some better purpose and that's going to be a much better world. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>